tonight I'm going to start a, uh, a new uh, teaching that I'm just going to call it the importance of being fruitful. The importance of being fruitful. But before I start that, uh, in here this evening praying, there's a couple verses that I felt in my heart that uh, the Lord would have me share. How many knows God's always good coming from his word? Amen. Our opinions are good. They can help. But God's word is the one that brings life. Amen. God's word is the one that brings life. And uh, so often, life gets jambled up. You ever had life jambled up? Yes. How many here has ever had life jambled up? All right. Let me tell you, uh, I, I use this example today with people, and I've used it before. How many has ever put puzzles together? Anybody ever been puzzles? How many, anybody ever been puzzled? All right. All right. But uh, besides being puzzled, we have put puzzles together. You know, no one goes when they buy a puzzle, they don't go open up the box to see what's inside the box. What do they look at? The picture. The picture. Then they may shake the box, but the truth is, what attracts them? The pieces or the picture? The picture. Now, you, you buy the box of puzzle, maybe a thousand piece, it may be two thousand piece, it may be a three thousand piece puzzle. And you buy the puzzle, no matter what you want it to look like, and you take it home and you open it up, and the first thing you do is dump it out. Now, what you dump out looks nothing like the picture. Nothing like the picture. How many has ever felt like your life is like all those pieces, and you just get your life dumped out on top of that? But the first thing you got to do when you put a puzzle together is what? When you dump the pieces out, what do you do next? Separate. You turn everything over. And then you find the piece on the box that's one solid color, and you start looking for them colors. Then you put your border around it. And if you stay faithful, what's in that box, those little pieces in that box will start looking like the cover. Sometimes people's life is like a puzzle. They get all dumped out and pieces everywhere. But if you allow the picture here, if you keep yourself in this, eventually all of your broken pieces will look like the box. All your broken pieces will look like the box. Some people walk around, you know, with pieces missed here and pieces missed there. But let me tell you what, God's got a way that he wants you to be. There's an image for you to look like. But you've got to know what it should be look like and you you know what you should look like based upon based upon what the word says now here's some verses uh tonight that uh that i wanted to read and the blue ribbon tells me where to start that's a good place right now let me look at this during this time not everything well let's say this during life not everything goes right you know how many people still get hurt offended i've preached on hurts and offense for 13 years. And you know what people still get? Listen to this. These are things that is written in red. Say written in red. This is, this is, the, this is the, the prelim to the message of fruitfulness. But in Matthew's gospel, let me tell you this so you, if you want to shout, you can shout. Matthew's gospel chapter 11. Yeah. Thank you. But I'm just going to read verse 18 and 19. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say he has a devil. Now in that matter, you know, they said he has a devil. He come neither eating nor drinking, say he has a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking and they said, look, a glutton, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. So Jesus was called a glutton. He was called a wine bibber. He, uh, he wasn't looked well upon. And then over here in another verse, I'm going to show you some other things that, uh, that Jesus was called. I don't know why I shut that up because I had a place there and I moved that there. The one place was that uh, the Bible said that uh, Jesus was together with the people and uh, talking about a house divided against itself cannot stand. 
And in that story, talking about a house divided itself, divided against itself cannot stand. And the truth is, a house divided cannot stand. You understand that? A house divided cannot stand. Now, you are the temple of God and the house of God. And if your mind doesn't get renewed to match what's in your spirit, this house can be divided and you'll never live in victory. If you allow your mind to keep dominating you, a house divided cannot stand. But then they said this about Jesus. He is Beelzebub. What is Beelzebub? He's the prince of the demons. So being called a wine bibber, being called a glutton, a babbler, and then also not just being called a devil, but saying, now you are prince of the devils. But you know how much that bothered Jesus? Zero. Zero. You know what he kept doing? Being fruitful. Kept following the will and plan of the Father. It's amazing on how, how little God's people grow and develop because we can't get out of flesh and allow what's on the inside of us. God's interested for growth. God's interested for us to be his image as the body upon the earth. If we are the body of Christ, we should reflect the image of God. The image of God. You know, Pastor Crab's church is called Imago Dei. I've had people ask him, is that a Spanish church? Because they see Imago Dei. He said, no, that's Latin for image of God. That means we are transformed into the image of God. So if we are to be transformed into the image of God, then shouldn't that be our goal and our task to make it sure that we reflect the image of God? And it's almost like people fight for the right to live opposite. Yes. Yes. I've watched people fight for the right to stay sick, fight for the right to stay bound. They wrestle for the right to still live in defeat. Let me tell you what, somewhere people's got to quit making excuses and just say, I'm going to start maturing and growing in God. Amen. When you're born, you're a baby. Babies wear diapers. You get the little sucky things. Whatever you call them, pacifiers, foolers, binkies, whatever you call them. You get, you get the little sucky thing and you get the sucky bottle. You, you never eat from a spoon. It's always the, the bottle, bottle, bottle. And then eventually, I remember when uh, my firstborn here, I used to say, dear Lord, I don't mind feeding her, but I can't wait till the day that she can at least hold her own bottle. <laughs> you know, one day she started holding her own bottle. And then I'm thinking... Man, wouldn't it be great when you're walking somewhere and you don't have to carry her and she can just walk beside you? And then I made, then, then it's amazing, after the first one, you get to thinking, you know, she grows up a little bit and thinking, man, she grew up so fast. And then thinking, I'll never do that again. Then Maddie comes along. Man, I can't wait till she can hold her own bottle. <laughs> it's like you learn nothing. And, uh, and so the point is that, you know, naturally there's growth. There's growth. How does babies grow? You feed them, you change them, and you enjoy them. You get healthy growth. And then all of a sudden, Brittany, Maddie, and Josh are no longer on the passy. Then they're no longer on the bottle. And then no longer on diapers and no longer on pull-ups. Now they're in big boy and big girl pants. I would to God that God's people get into big boy, big girl pants. <laughs> I feel pretty good tonight. And then so we go through the toddler stage. Then we start, we start nicknaming them, the terrible twos. And so forth and so on. And then they get out of the toddler stage, and then they get into the preteens. And then they get into the teens. And then you wish they were toddlers again. And then next thing you know, they're graduating, they're young adults, then they become adults, then they become mommies and daddies, and next thing you know, we become grandparents and so forth. Isn't it amazing on how everything else we want people to grow? As parents, we do our best to make sure that if we can just get them out of this bot, diaper, if we can just get them off this bottle, if we can just get them off the passy, if we can just get them to where they can tie their own shoes, if we could just get them to get up in the morning and know how to put on clean underclothes and get dressed for school. 
Does this ever resonate with anybody here? You're looking at me like I... So with all of that, with all of that, there's different levels of growth. You know, we want kids to grow up, but it's amazing spiritually. People don't think about that. You got some people in the body of Christ been saved for 25, 30 years, still in the toddler stage. Still spiritual toddlers. Still spiritual preteen. I can tell that because the way they throw the little tantrums. By the way, they still act. By the way, they still carry on. They're just pre, 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 pre. But the Bible says that we can, he says, grow up and be no more children, but be mature in him. Now, this is a part of being, having a fruitful life. Being a fruitful life. And now we've all, we've all, we've all, we've all. I've passed up some marvelous opportunities already this week to get bothered. And maybe have yielded to one or two. Come on. How many's passed up opportunities this week to be bothered? How many's yielded to one or two? Thank you. I'll raise my hand with some of you all. But we all pass up opportunities. We should pass up more than we yield to. The balance should be a little more than others. But God is looking for fruitful children. Fruitful children. Today is God's birthday. He's getting closer to the 50 mark. Uh, did, uh, today is. Today is 50. No, 49. I was going to say I didn't think so. I thought it was. He still looked kind of happy today. <laughs> Today's his birthday. Give Scott a hand for Dave's birthday. <laughs> but here in a little bit, Scott and Amy's identity is going to change. See? He used to be Scott, then he went to dad, daddy, then he went to dad. But soon he's going to be grandpa, grandpa. And then their identity changes. Eventually, you, 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 who you were, you no longer are. Went to the kids' this thing last night, and it was, it was Papa and Mimi. It's no longer, you know, you got Josh, Maddie, Brittany, daddy. But then you got another generation. Papa and Mimi. Eventually, your whole identity changes. The older you get, the more identity you get. And walking with God, the more we walk with God, we ought to be more aware of who we really are. Amen. You're changed from glory to glory. I'm using them because they're getting ready to have that baby. And you're going to be great. Grandparents. You go from glory to glory. And we ought to go from maturity to maturity, walking with God, being more fruitful every day. Amen? Now, how many love being parents? I don't care if you, you birth them yourself or you die, don't matter. How many loves being a parent? How many love being grandparents? Great. We won't stop at great, 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 great. There's always there. So the point is, our, even though our identity changes by name, the fruitfulness of life, naturally and spiritually, must continue to carry on. God wants us to be fruitful. And to do so, we've got to grow. We've got to grow and develop. And so we grow out of things and we grow into things. We grow out of one stage, we grow into another. How many know spiritually, you grow out of one stage and you grow into another? We used to bear little fruit, now God wants us to bear much fruit. Well, how do you bear much fruit? You've got to be pruned. Oh, I don't like being pruned. I don't like being pruned. But to, be, to bear much fruit, you've got to be pruned. So we want to talk about being fruitful. I've already taken around three blocks to get there. But we want to talk about being fruitful. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Say fruitful. How many likes being fruitful? There's something about, well, wasn't it a command? We'll, we'll, instead of starting there, we'll end up getting to it later on in the teaching. Wasn't it, what, what was one of the first commands in the Bible? Be fruitful. You know what God wants people to be? Fruitful. He wants us to be fruitful. Here we go. Colossians 1. This is a prayer that Paul prayed for the church of Colossae. And uh, I, I love this prayer. Verse 9. For this purpose, for this reason, we also, since the day that we heard, do not cease to pray for you. What does that mean? He's never quitting, is he? And making mention of you, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask 
and making mention and ask that you may be filled. Let me go back here. And uh, for this reason, for this purpose, we also, since the day that we heard, do not cease to pray for you. And to ask, declare, to pray that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will, his will. How? In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing, being fruitful, and a work every now and again. What is it? How many works? That you may be pleasing unto the Lord, unto every good work, and increasing, I like this, fruitful and increasing, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So he wants us to be fruitful unto every good work. Fruitful, say fruitful. fruitful. Strengthened with all might by his glorious power. Unto all patience and long suffering with joy. Fruitful unto every good work. This is the prayer that he prayed that we'd be fruitful in every good work. I've said this before and I want to repeat it. Winning is God's purpose for our lives. Yes. Winning is God's purpose. God never intended for us to, to be losers. Winning is God's purpose for our lives. And it can happen as long as we stay with him. Winning is God's purpose for our life. God never created you to lose. I know you've heard it said, it's not whether you win or lose, but it's how you play the game that counts. I don't like that. It's all about winning. You got to know how to be a good winner. And if you do get beat, you got to have to learn how to live in victory the same way. But it's not. It is how you walk with God. It is how you play the game, but we play to win. You know, when Josh was in T-ball, it was, it, it was a hard pill to swallow. Everybody gets to bat. Everybody gets to hit. And then everybody gets to hit because there's really no outs. It's just everybody gets to hit. Nobody loses. It always ends equal. Now, that's how we start kids off. But how long do they stay there? No. As soon as they get to coach pitch, it's three outs. And then next thing you know, it's still in basis. And next thing you know, it's winning and losing. It's the joy of victory and it's the agony of defeat. But you know, this, this mentality nowadays, you shouldn't, make, you shouldn't put kids under pressure about winning. Kids don't need pressure about winning. It's amazing. When we were kids, nobody cared about the pressure. It's suck it up, cupcake. <laughs> Rub some dirt on it. <laughs> You're not dying. When I was in school, we walked in snow up to our waist, uphill going and uphill coming back. How in the world did that ever happen? But that's what you hear. But nowadays, coddle, coddle, comfort, comfort. We don't want to mess them up. But let me tell you what we must learn. We can't allow that world system to affect us in everyday walk with God because what's happening in the world is now affecting Christians. No, God wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to win. He wants us to win. And I've said this many times, hundreds of times. Well, you know, pastor, you know, before, even for us, pastor, you know, brother Ken, uh, I may lose a battle, but I won't lose the war. Let me tell you, you lose, lose enough battles, you lose the war. I don't care. You go back and look at American history, world history, the more battles you lose, the more you'll lose the war. The Civil War favored the North. Why? Because the South lost more battles than they could stand, and therefore they didn't make it as the winners. You take, it didn't matter, the wars before that, you take Vietnam, you take the Korean War. You take the other wars. The, the losses adds up. And next thing you know, you can't overtake them. You can't overcome. Don't settle for losses. Don't settle in getting beat. Don't settle. We have to make sure that we continue to walk with God. 
we have to make sure that we get this. All right, go with me. Let's, let's kick this off. Go back to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16. I say unto thee, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill. What? The lust of the flesh. Is there, lust, is there a such thing called lust of the flesh? Yes. Amen. Is there a such thing called the pride of life? The pride of the eye? The lust of the flesh? For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. So that you cannot do those things. That what? Say it real loud. You cannot do those things that you would. But if you are led by the spirit... You are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are these. This is what's evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness or lewdness, idolatry, witchcraft or sorcery or any sorts of it, hatred, contention, jealousy. Here's Here's another word. Outburst of wrath. Instead of wrath, how about outburst of wrath? You know, so it's not, this word is not just wrath, where it says wrath, it deals with outburst of wrath. What's in you is going to eventually what? Come out of you. I've told these kids, I've told Josh, I've told people, quit practicing your anger. Quit practicing your attitude. Quit practicing it. You're becoming good at it. Whatever you practice, you perfect. Come on. Don't practice that. Don't practice that. Well, what do you practice when, you, when, when kids are in sports? What do they practice? They keep practice the things that work. Practice makes. It does. Practice is what puts you in a place with responding without thinking. That's what practice does. Is practice important? Does practice build habit? It does, doesn't it? Why, why, why does people want to practice the flesh? You know what people say? I want to quit, but I can't. Why? You practice too long. You don't even have to think about blowing up and blowing off. Why? Because you have become so good at it. People that become so good at being selfish, you know what's hard to break? Why? Because they practice it so much. What if, what if we start practicing love? Start practicing forgiveness. Come on. Whatever you practice, you perfect. And the Bible talks about being perfected in the spirit. So if we're going to be perfected in the spirit, then we need to practice the things of the spirit. Because if you practice the flesh, it's going to bring you heartache. Whatever you practice, that's what you're going to be good at. it. Because it becomes by impulse. It becomes by habit. Not only wrath, but outburst of wrath. Strife. You, you, you know another way to put strife? Selfish ambitions and, and different things as such. Heresies. Dissensions. Envy. Murders. Drunkenness. Revelings. And of such like of which, I tell you before, just as also told you in the past, they that practice or do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I wonder if God really meant that. They that practice these things shall not do what? It's amazing. I don't believe people really believe that. Because if people really believed it, you know what they'd quit doing? Quit practicing. It's amazing. God's a God of mercy. God, God's a God of grace. You know, it doesn't matter. God's going to be there. This is New Testament. This is the church of Galatians. He said, they that practice these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. It's uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. As such, there is no law. So, There is fruitfulness. Fruit's going to come out from you, either from your flesh, 
it's going to bear fruit or the things of the Spirit's going to bear fruit in your life. You're going to be fruitful. It's just what kind of fruit does people want? I was, I love fruit. And uh, sometimes overseas you get fruit that's not so fruity. There was a fruit that one place, it was almost black. They said, this is a fruit. And I'm thinking, I don't even want to try it. It looks, it looks rotten. And uh, I was in one area. I think it was in Thailand. They had this one thing. They called it a, uh, uh, oh, mine went blank on it. They're big. They're pink. Grapefruit. And they said, this is a grapefruit. I said, I've never seen a grapefruit look like that. This thing looked like, it, it almost looked like a honeycomb. And they said, it's a grapefruit. And you know, we ate it. You know what it did not taste like? A grapefruit. <laughs> Some fruit is delicious. Some fruit can be tolerated. Others can be celebrated. There's a fruit called papaya. Anybody like papaya? Very good for your digestive system. They'd always serve it overseas, especially Kenya would have a lot of papaya. Wayne Gardner looked at it and go, Ooh. He said, that's like eating motor oil. That's what he called it, motor oil. Well, it's fruit. Well, I don't like that kind of fruit. But the fruit that ought to come from our life ought to be sweet. It ought to be desirable. It ought to be something that people find refreshing. You know, fruit can refresh you. I love fruit. It is refreshing. The fruit that comes from our life ought to be refreshing. We ought to refresh one another. Not the works of the flesh, but we ought to have fruit of the Spirit. Now, I want you to notice this fruit is singular. The fruit of the Spirit. It has different attributes, but it's one fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. But God wants us to continue to be fruitful. But I did start finding areas where I found fruit as being plural and not just singular. And it goes back to another. So I'm going to uh, not totally walk away from walk away from this, but I want to show you something else. Since you're in the book of Galatians, just a couple books over, uh, you'll find the book of Philippians. Ephesians, Col Ephesians, Philippians. You'll find the book of Philippians here. And if you look in the book of Philippians, the very first chapter, you'll find another prayer that Paul prayed. This is a prayer that Paul prayed starting off in verse 9, for this I pray, that your love, 1, 9, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge, say in knowledge, in all discernment, that you may prove things that are what? Excellent. That you may be sincere without what? Offense. That you may be sincere without offense until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ until the day of Christ. Verse 11. Being, you, let's read verse 11 together. Being with the uh, of righteousness. What, what is it a fruit or fruits? Oh, so there's the fruit, singular of the spirit, but there are fruits, fruits, plural, of righteousness. Anybody righteous here? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Think about it. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So what is the old thing that passed away? Your ungenerated unborn life Amen. the old man old things the old man is gone you became new a new creation the dead man was res that dead man with void of life became reborn if any man be in Christ he is a new creation a new species something that never lived the old has passed away what that old nature Aren't you glad your old nature is gone? That old nature was fruitful in its own right. But there is a new nature inside of you that needs to take on the fruit of God. 
and the nature of God. The old nature is gone. So why do you want to act like you still have that old nature when you've already been born again? It's amazing. Oh, now people make excuses for the flesh. Not, not, not anybody that's a member of Covenant Peace. But you'll find people in other churches. No one here. But you'll find people in other churches that love to make excuses for the flesh. Preachers are just as bad. I was talking to someone about this uh, up at Pastor Barkley's last week. There was a thing that went around when the big push about I'm a prophet, I'm an apostle, I'm an evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And uh, there was this big thing about prophets being being bold and just telling people off. That was the big deal. And so I had, I had a gut full, so to speak, of people not controlling their flesh and getting offended and running their mouth and saying, oh, that, that's just that prophet's anointing in me. No, that's just your flesh. And if you weren't so spiritually ignorant, you'd realize it yourself. It's your flesh. I've told more than one person. That's not a prophet's anointing. That's your flesh. That's like Pastor Barkley said. Who here is in the five-fold ministry and somebody knows it besides you? You know, it's amazing. If you're a prophet, somebody else ought to know it besides you. Come on. I'm not the only one that knows when I preach well, and I'm not the only one that knows when I don't. No matter what you do, somebody else knows besides you what you're going through. Come on. Ah, that's just that, ah, that's just that prophet's anointing. No, that's just your flesh. And if you don't discipline it and practice another way, this is going to mess you up. But the old has passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So let me ask you a question. If all man was born in sin because of the fall of Adam, it's a good question, good theology question. Let's see how many people's listened to me the last 13 years. How many people allowed the button on the bottom when they sat down, it presses, and they fall asleep? We'll see which ones disabled their button. All right. Here's the thing. If the old thing, which is the nature, the old nature, the sin nature is gone. That's the sin nature. If you're born again, do you still have a sin nature? No. Now, I know some people preach that we have two natures. I don't believe we have two natures. If you have two, two natures, then you're entertaining another spirit that shouldn't be in you. Because one of them is trying to lead you, and the other one is trying to drive you. The Spirit of God's trying to lead you. There's another spirit trying to manipulate you and drive you. Whichever one you feed becomes your boss. Whichever nature you feed becomes the one that guides your life. So if the sin nature is gone, we're talking about being fruitful. If the sin nature is gone, do we believe if you're in Christ that sin nature is gone? Then where, then, then what causes us to sin? What causes us to sin? Where, where, where does the sin issue come in at? If the sin nature is gone and the sin nature is what causes us to sin, where, where does sin come in at? We like to preach that the sin nature is gone. Okay, if the sin nature is gone, then what's wrong with me? Because if I sin. The Bible says in John, if you sin. It didn't say when. It says if you sin. Do you have to sin? Well, everybody sins. You're right. But do you have to sin? No. 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 The Bible says, don't let any man say when he's tempted. He's tempted of God. For God can tempt no man. For every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and he is enticed. And when that lust, lust has conceived or manifest, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin 
is finished, it bringeth forth death. So every man that ends up in sin is carried away with a lust issue. Well, I'm not in no sexual sin. Lust is not all sexual. The word lust literally means a strong desire or strong craving for. It's not just physical. It's anything that it's a strong craving or strong desire for. No man's going to say, I lusted over Krispy Kreme. That just wouldn't go well. <laughs> but it's a strong craving after and a strong desire for. A man is drawn away by his own lust and he's enticed. And when that lust is conceived or, or when it's fed, it bringeth forth sin now. And when sin has wretched its place of sin, now it's death because for the wages of sin is death. Sin always produces death in some form or another. So if you're born again and the sin nature is gone, see, in the old nature, you, can't, you couldn't be fruitful if you tried. Spiritually fruitful. You couldn't be fruitful if you tried. But with the new nature, you got the ability to be fruitful in the things of God. What concerns me is people got a new nature and still bears more fruit of the flesh than they do of the spirit. That would concern anybody. That's concerning you about your own kids, wouldn't it? If you raise them right and they still produce things of others and not what you taught them, that would bring concern. All right? So what, what, what is this? Tell me what got born again in your life. You are spirit. You possess a soul and you live in a body. Which part of you got reborn? Your spirit. Did your body get reborn? Did your mind get reborn? No. So what responsibility do you have over your mind? You got to renew it. You got to renew it. The Bible says in James, receive the engrafted word of God, which has the power or is able to save your soul. He's already talking about people born again, but people get caught up with this word soul. That's why I've tried to fix it for all these years. Because people say, you know, God, you know, how, how many souls got saved in your meeting? Well, none of the souls got saved. They still need to be renewed. People got born again. But because we interchange so many words and make them one, people get confused. That's why in old Pentecost, somebody got saved at the altar. And the next day, they still lit up camel. I still want to be a Marlboro man. And people say, oh, I thought they got saved. They did get born again. The man on the inside got born again. It's just now they got to change their habits. They got to change their lifestyle. They got to change their, their method of operating. Yes. Now they got to start thinking different. You got to take the word and drive out the stinking thinking and allow the refreshing of God to come in. Amen. Amen. Or I've heard Brother Hagin tell stories that there was this one man that got saved at the altar, used the word saved, and there was one of those meetings where 10, 11 o'clock at night, everybody closed out and people got born again and people were shouting and crying and dancing and weeping. And this one guy got accepted Jesus, but there was no emotion at all. And he said he could hear people talking. I don't think he got anything because they tied it to emotion. As an old timer had said, Dave, Dave Robinson, I've talked about it, and we've talked about this phrase, better felt than telt. <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, but he didn't have any emotion. He didn't have any emotion. So he was working with the guy. They were, they were moving furniture. They, they were furniture movers. Moving furniture. And on the third or fourth day after that Sunday, that week, the man was carrying something to another man, and he set it down and, and began to weep and say, my God, I thank you. And then the other people on the job said, well, we thought he got saved the other night, Sunday night, but it looks like he just got saved. What was their basing it upon? Emotion. Does faith operate by what you see or, or what you don't see? Even if you don't, somebody that genuinely believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth, genuinely, 
the Lord Jesus, they, they shall be saved or born again. He didn't say that if they believe in their heart, confess their mouth and cry and shout, it's not. He said if they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth, they shall be saved. Now, that's the same verses for healing. If you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus is a healer and you shall be healed. That doesn't mean you're going to have some, feel like some lightning bolt go through you either. But you've got to still believe it the same way. you still got to believe it the same way. I think things keep us from being fruitful because people are so moved by their emotions and what they feel or don't feel. It talks them out of or convinces them from that God's really working in their life. And God wants to work in your life over and over, more and more, more and more. Amen. So the sin nature is gone, but people continue to yield to the flesh. Yield to the flesh. People yield to the flesh. And people refuse to renew their mind, and therefore they continue to walk in sinful things. I don't know who I first heard it from. I'll be honest with you. I'd give them the credit. I've said it for so long. It's become my phrase, but I'm not the one who came up with this. I remember the day that I was praying and the Lord brought it back to me. So it's as if the Lord said it, but I know I heard it beforehand. And this is, I don't know how it comes out. Here's how I formulated it. The reason why most people live in defeat is they have undeveloped spirits. They don't do anything once they're born again to grow in God. They have unrenewed minds and uncontrolled flesh. So if we can fix these three things, then we can learn to live a fruitful life. We can grow in the spirit. We can renew our mind and control our flesh, and we can live a fruitful life. But this scripture here in Philippians, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Now, when you think about the fruits of righteousness, People would think, what is the fruit of righteousness? Well, it's love. No, that's the fruit of the Spirit. It's long-suffering. No, that's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruits of righteousness, these are things that should, be, that should come out of a righteous life. You know what this verse ties back to? A verse that we all know. It's posted all over the place in his house. It's called Isaiah 54, 10 and 11. Those places there. I think it's the greatest picture of the fruits of righteousness. Say fruits. Now, don't lose your place in Philippians. I may come back and mention that. But go to Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, 10. Isaiah 54, 10. We're going to talk about this and we're going to, I'm going to read 10, then we're going to go, it starts at 10 and actually it's going to go all the way down. Uh, so let's read, it. let's read 10. For the mountains shall depart and the hills shall be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord God who hath mercy on you. All right? Now, let's just jump down to verse 13. All your children, say all the children. Now let me ask you, are you a child of God? So that referred to you as well. All your children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace. What kind of peace? The covenant of God's peace. Why do, I, why, why do I want the children's ministry to be strong here? Because of this. Great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness thou shalt be established. You shall be established. Established in what? Righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? Well, Pastor, it's, it's, uh, it's right standing with God. Well, I know a lot of people that's right standing with God's got born again that really has no concept of true righteousness. They're still beat down. They're still struggle. They still have a low self-esteem about their self. They still don't believe God's going to hear them when they pray. Righteousness is not just right standing with God. Righteousness is right standing with God is trumpet blows, you're out of here. But righteousness is a little bit more intimate than that. Righteousness is the ability to stand complete firmly, to have a firm stand. Righteousness is the ability to stand without wavering in the presence of God. You got to know you can come in the presence of God. Righteousness is the ability to stand in the presence of God without the sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. 
that deals with the identity. Righteousness is the ability, not just right standing with God. How many people pray for me? Well, pray for yourself. I just don't know if God's going to hear me. You don't have the confidence to stand in the presence of God. There's some kind of inferiority, some kind of lack in your life. And therefore, you don't believe that God's going to see you as a real son or daughter of God. A real son or daughter of his own. You don't, people struggle with that. So righteousness is the ability to stand in the presence of God without the sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. That's true righteousness. So in righteousness, the ability to stand in the presence of God without the, without the sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. In righteousness, you shall be what? Establish. For you shall be far, for, you shall be far from oppression. For you shall not fear, and from terror, terrorist or terrorism, for it shall not come near you. You know what some of the fruits, plural, of God's, of righteousness is? Talking about being fruitful. There's the fruit of the Spirit, and there are the fruits of righteousness. The part of the fruits of righteousness is to stand as a child of God, free from oppression, free from terror, and free from fear. When you see a Christian faced with all kind of turmoil and they say, I refuse to fear, do you know what I see? A fruitful, redeemed man or woman of God. When I see someone that stands against oppression, weighed down by the responsibility of life, instead of ending it but continue to go forward, I'm not just seeing a person that got born again. I'm seeing fruit of a righteous man and woman of God. It's time that we become more fruitful. Why? Because you're redeemed. There are certain things out of being in you. That means we don't run anymore. We don't wave the white flag to surrender. We stand in the face of adversity, in the face of fear, in the face of oppression, in the face of terror, and say, you're not going to come near me. In these last days, God's people are going to shine as lights. Why? Because it's fruits, plural. You have different things coming out from you. We have the fruit of the Spirit, singular, but we're going to have the fruits of the Spirit. And Paul prayed that they would be, that live and walk in the fruits of righteousness. I love the fruits of righteousness. But you know it doesn't come natural? You know love should come natural, but it doesn't for some people. I just can't love that person. Sure you can. No, I can't. Sure you can. What makes you think I can't? Because love is in you. He lives in you. He is love. God is love. I just don't have peace. Sure you can. Why? Peace lives in you. We, we all love the song, He is the Peace Speaker. He knows you by what? Name. Name. You can't have peace. Why? Because he's in you. Who's in you? The Prince of Peace. But you got to be intimate with that prince to have his peace. He is the prince of peace. I love the opportunity to actually walk with God and be, and be confident with it. The other day, the, the other day after church, to be honest with you, it might have been last week. When did you guys go down to Pizza Hut? Two Sundays ago, it was raining outside. It was on a Sunday night. Her and Josh, other people was going to go. And I said, I just want them to go home. And uh, Angel said, you you pick something up in your spirit? I said, you know, sometimes, honey, it's hard with your kids. Inside, I feel like they're okay. But it's like this protectiveness is just strong sometimes as a parent. No, I don't believe. And I stood there before I pulled out of this driveway. God, I thank you that my kids and the kids are going down there and the people of that place are in your hand. Angels take charge. Not just over mine, but over all of them. Why? The enemy will torment people with fear. Don't, don't, don't. You can't go, 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 you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, fear will dominate people's life. I said, no, it's not a, an alarm like something's going to happen. It's just the whole thing is they're safer with me. But they're not any more safer with me. How many's ever gone through that? They're not safer with you. 
Huh? <laughs> Thank you. My sins have found me out. But the point is, that's why at schools, I don't care if they have security at all doors. You can't trust the security to protect your kids. You still got to trust God. And the righteousness of the Lord shall be bold and say so. Amen. Amen. Nothing shall come near us. Nothing. No weapon formed. Well, thank God when I get saved, there's not going to be more weapons. No, it says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. They may be formed. People may come against you. They may call you a wine bibber. They may call you Beelzebub. They may call you all kind of stuff. This old preacher, this old country boy preacher, one day he was preaching on this, and he says, uh, we got to cast out old Beasley bub. <laughs> Man, sometimes you just got to just get serious with old Beasley bub and say, you're not going to torment me anymore or my family. I got fruits of righteousness in my life. Amen. All right, let's stand. Come on.